Hi, my name is Ruvin Kaur. I'm a second year internal medicine resident at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Today's interview is part of a collaboration between Radcliffe Cardiology and the Cardio Nerds. I have the pleasure of being a part of the Cardio Nerds as an Academy Fellow and the Director of the Cardio Nerds Internship. I'm so excited to introduce Dr. Michelle O'Donohue. Dr. Donohue is a cardiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and a Senior Investigator in the Timmy Thetty Group. Dr. O'Donohue's research interests include management of acute coronary syndromes, the use of biomarkers for risk stratification, and heart disease in women. She's the principal investigator of the Ocean A dose trial that we'll, we will be discussing today. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Donahue, and I'm really excited to discuss this late-breaking trial from AHA 2022. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm, I'm happy to discuss these exciting results. So the Ocean A dose trial is a phase two multi-center randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial of ulpicerin, a small interfering RNA molecule that reduces lipoprotein A production in hepatocytes, and specifically looking at patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And we know that over the past few decades, there have been epidemiological studies supporting an association of higher plasma lipoprotein A concentrations and the risk of ASCVD. Dr. Donahue, could you tell us a little bit more about the background and rationale behind this trial, as well as the role of pharmacologic therapies to decrease lipoprotein A, specifically ulpicerin? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so as, as you alluded to, it, we really have a growing body of evidence that supports the idea that lipoprotein little a plays a causal role in atherosclerosis. Um, we have, you know, for years we had epidemiologic data, but we also have um, a growing amount of, of genetic data as well, Mendelian randomization data, to, to really support the concept that LP little a um, is directly involved with atherogenesis. But up until this time, we have not had any therapies that really lead to a marked or sustained reduction in LP little a. Um, we know, for instance, that statin therapies, um, which are, of course, our mainstay for, for trying to prevent progression of atherosclerosis, um, don't lower LP little a concentrations, and if anything, actually sometimes may, may raise it. Um, so there has been an unmet need to really develop therapies um, that lead to a, a very large reduction in, in LP little a, and ultimately as well, it's the way to really directly test the hypothesis that LP little a in fact plays a, a causal role. So, you know, you, you mentioned olpacerin. So olpacerin is, is a small interfering RNA. Um, and the way that it works is it, it targets the hepatocyte and then it is brought into the hepatocyte where basically it, it combines with a, a complex called the risk complex. And the one of the, the strands of the siRNA binds to the mRNA transcript of the LP little a gene. Um, and that gene trans, um, transcribes and then um, ultimately leads to translation of apo little a. That is one of the components of the LP little a particle. So what ends up happening is that olpacerin ultimately leads to the degradation of that mRNA transcript. And by preventing synthesis of the apo little a protein, you end up with a, a huge reduction in, in LP little a concentration. So it's administered subcutaneously every, every um, 12 weeks um, uh, is essentially the, the frequency of dosing um, that was primarily studied in this phase two trial. Thank you so much for explaining the mechanism and how it fits into other therapies. It definitely took me back to cellular and molecular biology from college trying to remember the mechanism of how these antisense particles work. I know the trial specifically used 150 nanomoles per liter, approximately corresponding to 60 milligram per deciliter as the threshold of lipoprotein A to define an abnormal level. And we know that there's differences in assays and variability in baseline distribution. So there may be different thresholds used to define an abnormal level. Could you explain a little bit about how the threshold to define an abnormal level was established for this trial, as well as other key inclusion and exclusion criteria? Yeah, so as you said, the, the study population was um, was a patient population with established ASCVD um, and an elevated LP little a concentration greater than 150 nanomoles per liter. Um, just for the listening audience, um, just so that everyone's aware that you can measure LP little a in nanomoles per liter 
or in milligrams per deciliter. And this sometimes causes some confusion um, as the numbers are quite different. Um, but we know that in a patient population with established ASCVD, about 20% of people will have a concentration above about 150 nanomoles per liter. Um, so that was the threshold that was selected for this phase two study. In part also, uh, the feeling is based on, on the data we have to date that we may need to see a very large absolute reduction in LP little a in order to see meaningful clinical benefit. Um, and so we're starting the experiment really with those with higher LP little a concentrations uh, so that we're really sure that we're testing the hypothesis directly. Um, as I said, I, I think that ultimately we're, we're one, trying to determine the efficacy and safety of a drug like opacerin, but then also just more purely trying to test the hypothesis of whether or not LP little a is involved with atherogenesis. That's great. Could you tell us a little bit more about the treatment protocol and the dosing and design for the trial? Sure, absolutely. So there were um, four different active doses um, of uh, opacerin that were being tested. Um, so there were three doses that were tested um, with a dosing frequency of every 12 weeks. Um, and then there was a fourth exploratory dose of opacerin that was dosed only every 24 weeks. Um, and this was done um, with a matching placebo arm. So it was a placebo controlled, um, double blinded, multi-center clinical trial um, that enrolled patients um, across seven different countries. Um, so ultimately 281 patients were randomized in this phase 2b um, dose ranging study. Great. And what were some of the demographics and baseline characteristics that were um, present between the two groups? Yeah, so they, they were overall reflective of the type of patient population we would expect to see. Um, you know, we enrolled a robust number of, of, of women, um, still a minority, but overall for, um, for a phase two program, we were happy to see that about a third um, of enrolled participants were, were women. Um, and uh, the majority were enrolled in North America, but we also had patients enrolled in Europe, Australia, and Japan. Virtually everyone in the study had a history of coronary disease, um, and more than a quarter had a history of, of MI. Um, and then the remainder were also patients with either peripheral arterial disease um, or cerebrovascular disease. Um, more than um, about 85% of patients were on a statin at baseline. Um, there was very good use of azetamibe. And also of interest, there was uh, really quite frequent use of PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, so roughly a, a quarter were on a PCSK9 inhibitor, which of course would be higher than what we'd expect to see in many of our practices. But in part, I think that the, the robust use of PCSK9 inhibitors was in part because we know that, that that is a drug that reduces LP little a concentration. So these were individuals who, despite being on a PCSK9 inhibitor, um, still had quite elevated LP little a concentrations. And at baseline, that average value of, of LP little a um, you know, was more than 250 nanomoles per liter. So really what we would consider to be very high concentrations. Yeah, it's interesting to hear about the number of patients that were on PCSK9 inhibitors, as you mentioned, it's a pretty significant amount on the secondary prevention population. So for moving on to the trials endpoints, um, I know the primary endpoint was percent change from baseline in life of protein A at week 36 in the intent to treat study population. And then the secondary endpoints were percent change from baseline in LP little a at week 48 as well as percent change in LDL, cholesterol, and APOB at week 36 and week 48. So what did the trial results show? Yeah, so the, the results were really very exciting. Um, what we found was that at doses of opacerin that were 75 milligrams or higher, so that the three doses that were tested were 10 milligrams every 12 weeks, 75 milligrams every 12 weeks, 225 milligrams every 12 weeks, and then, as I mentioned, there was that exploratory dose that was every 24 weeks. So at those two higher doses, the 75 and the 225 milligrams of, of um, every 12 weeks, we saw more than a 95% reduction um, in LP little a concentration. Um, in fact, when you actually placebo adjusted, um, the number ends up being even greater than 100%, um, only because there was a slight increase in, in the placebo arm in LP little a concentration over time. Um, so we, we saw with that highest dose, uh, really 101% um, 
placebo adjusted reduction in the least square means um, uh, uh, of LP little a compared to baseline. So those are the week 36 results. Um, you mentioned the week 48 results. Basically, they're, they're almost identical. So when you're dosing every 12 weeks, um, we saw the, the same uh, percent reduction at, at 48 weeks. The only thing to note was that for those individuals who are being dosed every 24 weeks, um, there we saw that there was a little bit of a, an attenuation. Um, so suggesting that I think that the, the every 12 week dosing is, is probably that sweet spot in terms of the dosing interval. Uh, yeah, wow, well, great, greater than 95% decrease is very, very impressive. And with any novel therapies, we always think about adverse effects or any side effects that patients might experience. What did that, what did the trial show in terms of safety data? Yeah, so uh, very encouraging to date. Of course, we're going to need to have a larger phase three program in order to definitively uh, demonstrate the, the safety of the therapy. Um, but so far, all we're seeing are injection site reactions and hypersensitivity reactions. The hypersensitivity reactions, though, are, are really just surrounding the injection site. Um, so these were primarily all localized um, reactions and mild and self-limiting. So uh, no action required and re resolved within uh, about 48 hours. So, you know, that was to be expected. Um, but otherwise, we're not seeing any uh, uptick in liver function abnormalities. There was no increase in myalgias. Um, you know, nothing else that, that would be of, of potential concern. That's great. And I know you mentioned earlier that now we know that we've known for a while that lipoprotein A is a known cardiovascular risk factor, but what's kind of still unknown is how large of a reduction in LP little a may be required to translate into a clean, clinically meaningful benefit. And based on these phase three trials, how do you anticipate this will inform optimal dosing as well as design of a phase three cardiovascular outcomes trial, as well as what threshold of LP little a level to use to enroll patients in a phase three trial? Yeah, no, we're, we're excited that the phase three trial is, ex uh, is expected to launch later this year. So first patient enrolled is targeted for December uh, 2022, um, and the trial is now uh, listed on, on uh, clinicaltrials.gov. It's called Oceana Outcomes. Um, the, the dose is yet to be released. But based on, on the data, you know, we would expect, um, of course, that, you know, we should be able to use um, uh, anywhere in this range of, of higher doses. Because also when we looked at the pr proportion of patients who achieved LP little a concentrations um, that were less than, for instance, 125 nanomole per liter, which many people have, um, you know, the, the exact threshold that we should target um, has been unknown, but many people have considered to, that to be a threshold of risk. And virtually everyone um, at those higher doses of opacerin um, was achieving levels below that range. Um, so as you said, I think that part of the, the challenge for the phase three is that we will have to, for this first pass, keep LP little a concentrations high um, for targeting those who are going to be enrolled because it's possible that we need to see a very large absolute reduction in LP little a to translate into clinical benefit. Um, but hopefully from there, you know, once we see positive phase three results down the road, you know, our hope is that we can, of course, broaden this um, to an even larger group of, of patients who may potentially benefit. Um, so I, I think we're, we're excited to see what the phase three program holds. Um, there is another phase three trial that, that's underway as well. There's an ASO um, that also uh, reduces LP little a concentrations. Um, and that trial is, is uh, already underway and has completed enrollment. Yeah, it's very exciting to hear about phase three data that we'll be soon seeing enrollment as well as uh, trial results for. So it's been really great to talk to you, Dr. Danu, about the trial. And I want to congratulate you and your team for all your hard work. And I'm looking forward to reading the paper when it's published. And thank you just so much for taking out time to talk with us today. Oh, thank you.